Well, hey, folks, welcome back to the show. I am Fist25, and we are here inside the cockpit of the Aegis Hammerhead. Right behind us is Crew L5, beautiful Glen Station, and uh, home to one of my favorite racing tracks, the beautiful Glen Circuit. So I made a video about a year ago, and it was kind of a day in the life of the Aegis Hammerhead, and it was more of a machinima than it was a ship review. So I thought, let's rectify that. It's patch 3.17.2. And I think we should take a look at the Hammerhead again and do a more in-depth ship review and see what this behemoth of a ship has to offer us today in 2022 and if it's still worth the $700 plus price tag that we would have to pay for it in real life so without further ado let's take the tour I, I was gonna do some stuff outside but we're gonna do the we're gonna flip this around we're gonna do the inside first and then we're gonna do the outside but the very first thing we're gonna do is roll that intro Hundred and eighty seven years ago, in March twenty seven sixty five, the UEE Military High Command issued a request for proposal seeking a dedicated anti fighter platform to replace the aging Gwine class ships of the line and become a dedicated anti fighter platform and fighter screen for the fleet. That was twenty seven years before the Mezers fell and Aegis Dynamics was the manufacturer of choice for the UEE Navy. Aegis was tasked with developing this new warship called Project Monitor. Aegis built six prototype ships and delivered two of them to the UEE Navy for test and evaluation. The result was that Aegis had built a fast warship that was agile enough to support the battle group and cheap enough to be manufactured in large numbers. Eight years later, in 2773, the first production ship was commissioned and set sail out of MacArthur in the Killian system, known as the UEES Hammerhead. These first ships were considered as Flight One ships, which harkens back to our modern times when aircraft are manufactured in lots, with significant upgrades in between them. After six months of space trials, were uneventful, five more Flight 1 hulls were approved and added to the 5th Fleet. The ships were a proof of concept for the newly developed Carrier Warfare Doctrine. The Navy was impressed with the performance of the Hammerhead and doubled their initial hull order with Aegis and later signed an additional expansion that requested permanent production of the ship. Just one year later, the Hammerhead's Flight 1s cut their teeth against the Vandal, destroying eight Vandal skirmisher ships without them ever getting in range, in visual range, of the flagship, with the UEES Triggerfish scoring impressive kills and later that year becoming the first Ace Hammerhead crew in history. By 2779, the Aegis had five factories in three systems churning out Hammerheads and the Navy bought them as quick as possible. In 2782, the UEES Tibero, a Flight 1 Hammerhead, was involved in a collision during a standard refuel rearm operation. As a result, the Navy requested major sensor changes in the Flight 2 models, and in 2817, 35 years later, the Flight 2 models were released. A radar emplacement was replaced with an additional turret and a redesign of the deck layout was incorporated, which crews have requested to make readiness more efficient. 37 years later, in 2854, Flight 2A models were deployed as the first wave of Flight 2 models were found to have a blind spot. After the fall of the Mezer dynasty in 2792, 
Many citizens consider the Hammerhead to be one of the representative ships of the tyrannical hierarchy. Their longtime partner and preferred shipbuilders, Aegis Dynamics, found themselves publicly disgraced, and some call for them to be charged with war crimes. The new UEE government looked to move away from Aegis, and thus sought out contracts with other ship manufacturers, such as RSI or Anvil. But lucky for Aegis, the military did not negotiate an exclusive license for a hammerhead design. So Aegis was free to adapt the design for civilian use and without government oversight. Speaking of the civil side, many civilians use hammerheads as armored transports or as one-off medical ships via the aftermarket, as Aegis has long since stopped customizing hammerheads. The most famous civilian hammerhead is the Twilight Ag Assessor, a Navy surplus fight flight 2A ship which was converted into a high-risk observation platform for tourists. She retained all of her mil-spec shielding, but converted all turrets into reinforced observation domes, allowing paying customers the experience of being up close and personal with nebu uh, nebulae, gas giants, solar flares, and other dangerous stellar phenomena. The ship unfortunately entered the zeitgeist after her complement was found dead in space, with absolutely no indication of a loss of oxygen or other damage, and she has since returned to service. Flight 3 models were deployed, which focused on an upgrade to modern command and control surfaces, with all hammerheads being replaced by Flight 3 models by 2915, in total a 61-year upgrade life cycle. The Flight 4 models are the current version of the Hammerheads, in-game as of 2947, a paltry 32 years later. Adding multiple additional remote turrets and tools for increased modularity. Only 15% of the Navy's inventory is still Flight 3 models, and those are mostly retired to reserve or homeland defense units. Note that the Hammerheads that are pledged or bought in-game are most likely Flight 3 models, as currently the Hammerhead in-game has no remote turrets. All of the turrets are manned. The Flight 5 models are still theoretical, and Aegis has begun early jump tunnel development. However, there is no naval contract in place, and they are unlikely to see a service opening in the next decade. However, the Flight 4 models are still in active production, with the Navy pairing the latest models of Hammerhead with a Polaris. Each balancing each other's strengths and weaknesses like a well-oiled machine and a one-two punch. The original hammerhead that survived testing, the MJX-3, survives to this day and is stored by Aegis and is as, as it is to be restored for a museum. Currently, the hammerhead is a ship that supports three to nine crew members, including the pilot, co-pilot, six different turret gutters, and an engineer to round out the nine personnel. It can carry up to 40 SCU of cargo and store 40,000 micro SCU of gear. It can be bought in game at Lorville for 12.5 million Alpha UEC or in time limited sales such as IAE or Invictus Launch Week for about 725 US dollars which is $175 more than the original War Bond concept price. The Hammerhead employs six manned turrets at the front left, the front right, the back left, the back right, the top, and the rear of the ship. All turrets employ a four pack of size four CF447 Rhino laser repeaters dishing out an impressive 2,048 sustained DPS each. That's a total of 12,228 sustained DPS in patch 3.17.2. The turrets are bespoke, but the size 4 weapons are modular. The Hammerhead also carries a generous complement of missile and missile racks. Eight size 5 missile hardpoints are on the Hammerhead, and the default loadout consists of 16 size 3 cross-section and 16 size 3 infrared missiles. That's a total of 32 size 3 missiles, which is enough to give any ship a bad day. 
The missile racks are modular, so a person or outfit could employ eight size five missiles, 16 size four missiles, 64 size two missiles, or even a whopping 128 size one missiles. The Hammerhead comes stock with low quality industrial grade uh, three stronghold shields. In t in, there's, there's two generator slots, giving the Hammerhead 200,000 shield hit points. In combination with 295,600 hull hit points, it is a massively armored and shielded ship. It does have two power plants and a military grade C superdrive, providing ample power for its large contingent of stock laser weaponry and shields. It comes with military grade C coolers in two slots again, providing more than enough cooling for the ship's need and it also comes with a very slow comma industrial grade C quantum drive. If you don't upgrade the drive, prepare for journeys from Microtep to Arc Corp, taking roughly 17 min minutes just in quantum. The ship is considered fast for its size. It, support, it sports a 105 meter a second SEM speed and a 1000 meter a second top speed. It has a huge hydrogen fuel tank of 15.1 million liters and 11,000 liters of quantum fuel. Of course, this large miniature Corvette doesn't maneuver like the fighters it was made to destroy because it just has 20 degrees of pitch, 18 degrees of yaw, and 60 degrees of roll, utilizing its 18 thrusters. For a ship of its size, the EM and IR signatures are actually quite low but don't expect this behemoth to be stealthily rolling up into a dogfight. Other ships are gonna know you're coming, but if you have a full crew of gunners, they better be moving along. The pilot for the Hammerhead does not have control of its guns. They are in fact, just a pilot. But the pilot and the co-pilot do have control of the missiles and can rain havoc down on ships that dare stand in their way. Although we aren't going to cover the brochure of the Hammerhead in this video, I do encourage everyone to stop by the RSI website and read it. It contains a wealth of information about the various ships history over the last century and a half, including some very famous battles with Hammerheads in the past, such as PCG 4550, the UEES Cheyenne Mountain, which is a city, well, it's a mountain that's close to a city that I live by and PCG-6109, the UEES Ingo. All right, thanks for uh, joining us back here at uh, Fisting Jawa Save the Universe. I did put my space helmet on because unfortunately there are a couple spots in the ship that are, uh, that have holes of no oxygen and I will suffocate. I found that out when I was filming some of the other shots for the video. So I'm going to keep it on here and we're going to go first person anyway. So what's it matter? So in front of me here is the cockpit of the Aegis Hammerhead. Um, it actually sits pretty darn close to the ground. Here is a view of the Hammerhead front on and you can see the cockpit section is at the bottom uh, just below the airlock and we can we can even zoom in a little bit here and uh, it, it, it's tinted windows, apparently. <laughs> but as we as we zoom in, we'll see that I'm kind of standing off to the side there. And uh, those are the two seats. So we're going to come back to the cockpit. We're going to explore the rest of the ship internally first, and then we'll go fly it around and fly it around in the atmosphere, fly it around in space and just take a good look at this ship. Um, notice there are some like some deck grating here and but below here it is a clear field of view so you can lo uh, land this giant ship. Anyway, we'll come back to the cockpit here. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to head towards this door. And actually, you have to take an elevator or uh, the ladder here to get down to the cockpit. So we're going to go ahead and take the elevator. I frequently take the ladder, though. 
So as we come up, um, we can see there is a door ahead of us. There's nothing behind us. That right there is the call elevator button and the door open. Notice there is some signage here that says bridge and we can even hear the hum of the fluorescent lights. Straight ahead, ahead of us as we're looking forward is the airlock. It does say caution airlock. So for those of you that can get confused, bridge, airlock, look down on the floor. As we come to the airlock, we can actually close the doors behind us. Um, and when you dock this ship to a station, this is one of the few ships that has docking, um, you will exit out of the airlock and it is conveniently in the front of the ship. So as we open up that front door, we'll also see the ability to open up. Oh, maybe. Maybe we can open this up. It's a little tricky. See, we are in zero G right here. <laughs> I have opened this up manually before, I promise you. It's a little tricky. There we go. Okay, the door to space is open. There is beautiful Glen Station, and here is the Aegis Hammerhead here. So we are going to re-enter the ship <laughs> through that airlock and fall on our face when we do it. There we go. We're going to go ahead and close this front door. And don't worry, that very front door will close when we jump into Quantum. Okay, so with the airlock closed, you've probably seen the outside of the hammerhead. Uh, there are, in total, there are six turrets. This is a monster of a ship for a, as a fighter screen. It is made to take down fighters and, uh, you know, medium, uh, large and heavy fire uh, and small fighters. Uh, it is not really meant to go up against capital ships. Uh, but it could take on even bigger ships than that if if it is fully crewed. So coming straight forward, looking right, looking left, we can see there's two sets of turrets. Over here is the front, even on the ground, turret. And this is the front right turret. So we're going to go ahead and enter this big guy. Doors are going to close. And we're going to come out to a turret that is mounted on a gimbal. Okay, let's turn on the turret. So right here is the power on button. There's the exit button. Gyro mode button, things like that. We have a couple. We have four multifunction displays in each turret, so not bad. Let's take an outside view. You can see us and on the right here, front right. We're looking down, looking different spots. And firing. Firing. It's got each of these turrets has uh, four CF447 uh, Rhino laser repeaters. So pretty darn impressive. Uh, they can they have a large uh, radius that they could fire at. And you got to imagine there's there's a turret in the back, turret on the top, and then four turrets on the side. So when this ship is fully manned, it is a monster for sure. So we can see us shooting out here each of these turrets has 240 rounds times uh, laser rounds times four guns that's a lot of firepower we're gonna go ahead and exit the turret it's gonna center the gimbal pull the seat back here nice animations with the doors and we'll go forward now i'm not going to show you the other side turrets because they're all the same but the front left turret is over here and it's the exact same animation as we head aft there's two sides to head aft there's the starboard side over here and the port side we're going to go ahead and take the port side you'll notice the ship is very military looking because in lore it did come from the uee military these are basically surplus ships that are hundreds of years old in between the ship here we can see there is kind of a uh, open space, open air section in between these two hallways. Right here to in front of us here is our elevator. Um, this elevator is where you can enter the ship from the ground. And we will be doing that uh, along with doing docking as well. Uh, there's one elevator over here and there is an elevator over there. 
but that's how you get in into the ship when it's on the ground or you can go into the cargo elevator coming back aft a little bit more we see a stairway going down this is this is a rather long ship but it's not as big as you would really imagine it to be now to my right is the turret and the escape pods here are the escape pods here um but this is one of the other side turrets here. This would be the rear port side turret and straight across all the way down there is the exact same thing there. There is some signage up here on top, even though it looks like this lights out, but you can see to the left is the bridge over there, the cargo and engine room. So we are going to come over here to the components section. The ship is supposed to be crewed with three to nine people, a full complement of uh, six gunners, pilot and co-pilot, it's eight, and then there's an engineer station. So this is one of the engineer stations in here that the engineer can manage all of the different components and systems on the ship. I don't think any of these open or, or are interactable, um, but they will be one day when we're able to actually repair the ship. Okay. And notice radar and life support. That'll be something we'll be able to fix one day. Now, I know the Hammerhead's one of the very first ships they're going to be implementing uh, that systems engineering type of type of work. Okay, before we completely head back aft here, we're going to take a look at the crew quarters. And of course, your crew has to have a place to sleep and rest and everything, right? So. Each crew has a uh, locker that opens up and they also have their own bunks. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight bunks in here for the, the main crew and the captain gets his own private quarters. There is a full toilet and hygiene section in here. Um, two toilets right there, a couple showers. The detail here with the, with the padding and everything is really, really good. Each crew member also gets their own locker, and I believe over here is another bathroom. So all in total, four showers, four toilets. Everybody should be happy. That's plenty. Um, coming over to the starboard side, we can see there is another components room with yet again another engineering station. And we see that's the turret and more escape pods on the starboard side. As we head further back aft, we enter the engine in the cargo room. So the very on the front side of it is uh, you can see the engineering and mess hall, it says. And this is an elevator over here. We're going to go ahead and call it. But we're not going to go in it yet. From this uh, this engine room, it has really good animations. You can see the engines working overtime. Um, we can actually come back here and this is uh, going to be another engineering station for the for the engine, I would suppose. And then there's an engine on, uh, on the other side as well. Right here is the cargo bay area, which right now it's empty, but you can easily park an Ursa Rover, some Cyclones, vehicles here. You can actually carry cargo with you here as well. And there are the uh, go up, go down cargo elevator. Um, buttons and screens you can see there's open space down there and there we go so easy to load things into the hammerhead we're gonna go ahead and bring that cargo bay up and the very very aft of the ship here you can see this says blast door and look on the bottom it does say turret as we go up here we're gonna go enter the rear turret and we're gonna in here we're gonna end up flipping upside down and boom so now we are in the rear turret of the ship we kind of wish it was a bottom turret more than a rear turret but there's the ship here we are in the rear turret same type of guns here turret moves on a really nice 360 degree gimbal this is a this is a really good turret to like if you needed to hit ground targets and things like that, uh, you have pretty good range of, of movement around here to hit some ground targets. Okay. And also the same amount of ammunition in all these turrets. All right, we're gonna flip right side up. No motion sickness at all. 
and we're gonna go down we're not gonna go into that elevator right there just yet but we're gonna go find the top turret which is probably the most popular turret and here in the midships area you're gonna see uh this is the the rear side turrets right there you're gonna see a top turret um painted with orange we're gonna go ahead and hop in this seat Sometimes the game has bugs when uh, you're moving around the ship and getting in the turrets when you're moving. And so that's that's why we're doing this static right now. Plus, the pilot has no weapons. So this is I'm showing you the weapons. So this is actually the top of the ship. These are the turrets on the top of the ship. And you can see that turret moving around. Pretty standard fare. This is one of the real anti-fighter turrets there. All right. Fantastic animations getting inside and out of the turrets. Although these doors don't like to open until you're right next to them. Right on them. There we go. Now it opened. We can see that this elevator in the midships takes us to the upper deck. We'll be taking that in just a sec. But before we do that, we're going to check out the captain's quarters. But yes, the ninth crew member, the captain, has his own core, his or her own quarters. Inside, you can see there's a nice little uh, seating area that we used to be able to sit on, but we can't sit on anymore. There's some shelves and stuff. We can be able to put our gear there one day. There's the actual captain's chair, which you can sit in, some screens behind them, things like that. And then this door opens up the actual sleeping area for the captain, so you can lie down on that um, and the captain has his own head with a toilet right here and a full and nice shower and also a closet to put all your captain uniforms all right so that is that let's head upstairs to the upper deck and we're gonna make our way up just like I said, there's two elevators that go to the upper deck. This is the forward elevator. And this is going to take us to this door. Now, I have seen the oxygen holes here on the upper deck, so this is why I would recommend wearing a helmet. As we come to the upper deck, kind of right in the middle here is the mess hall. We're going to go ahead and enter that. And so this is where the crew is going to take uh, Chow. There's a singular table. Um, not a whole lot going on. A couple screens that don't work, things like that. You got your, uh, your microwave and your food processor and things. Um, but quite a big area to do cooking. Back here is kind of a storage area for food. It's like a like a refrigerator pantry type, uh, type of deal. Um, lots of detail to the ship, but not a lot of function right now. It does have some good views out here, though. They do have, uh, in the mess hall, they have some views of uh, the space in that window. Go get some natural light, stuff like that. There is only one hallway on the upper deck, and this is it. So there is no other side. Coming back to the engineering section. As we enter here, notice this engineering station right here has a full view of the cargo area and it has access to different uh, kind of like a crane hook hoist mechanism um, so this hopefully should be able to lift things and and you'll be able to maybe do some maintenance or something like that and that's really about it for the engineer station up here here is the aft elevator We're going to call it and take it down. So surprisingly, this really kind of concludes the interior tour of the Hammerhead. It is a large ship. It's very it's it's long, but that's really all there is to it. There's not much more to it for it being as big of a ship as it is. Um, going down the starboard side, there's that other elevator that goes down. And so we're going to make our way to the bridge, um, which is in the center here. 
And we're going to hop into the cockpit seat. All right, so let's take a look at what it's like to fly this ship. All right, here we go. So from the cockpit seat, let's take a tour of the cockpit. Oh, we have two good size multifunction displays here that are pretty easy to see. Um, as far as things that are controllable from our sticks or our controls, there's not really anything there. There's our standard HUD here. And then up here we have our 2D radar. But we have two more multifunction displays that can do things here. Uh, these are the default screens. And then up here, I believe, is some of the cockpit controls. So there's our power button right there. This is open exterior, press to unlock. And is that all we got? Thought we had more. Maybe not. And there's our warning panel. Looks like <laughs> the hammerhead needs a little needs a little love as far as that stuff goes. I don't even see an exit. Oh, was it right there? There's our exit right there. So really, there's just power. And, uh, yeah, that's it. That's surprising. Just power and, and like open and close. And that's basically it for our, our cockpit tour. So we'll take a, a quick look on the outside of the ship here. Um, this is the stock paint scheme, which is basically kind of a military gray with orange accents. Um, it is a quite a large ship as you look at it um it's it's pretty it's it's pretty cool i really like that space in the center um and of course as we look at the ship like this it does have that hammerhead shark design which is probably why it's called the hammerhead um the hammerhead shark has a kind of a t-shaped uh head um, and then coming on back, we can see from below, it's got our, our hole in the middle there. And uh, there's our airlock and our, our bridge. And that's that's about it. It's in space. I guess it doesn't look too imposing, but it actually is pretty, pretty good size ship. I think it's besides the Carrick and the 890 Jump uh, and maybe the Reclaimer, it's probably like the fourth biggest ship in the game. We're going to go ahead and we are going to engage cruise control. OK, there we go. You can see the the engines uh, going at just regular cruise speed. It looks pretty darn good. We'll center our view and we'll come back to all right, let's see. It looks like our cruise speed is 103. Let me center. 104 meters a second. We're going to go ahead and boost our speed all the way up. And you see that we're, we're I mean, it, it's, it's got some it's got some movement. I mean, we're moving. It's actually a surprisingly nimble ship. And you'll see that in the combat scenes, it actually moves really, really well, um, especially in atmosphere, which is actually really surprising. It's fly it flies better than some smaller ships. OK, so we'll center out our gimbal here. I believe it has. Once it gets up to speed, I think it's a thousand meters a second for its top speed. Or at least that's what the stats show for some reason we slowed down there for a second i'm not sure why one thing about the ship is that it has a it's supposed to have and it does have a ton of armor you can see in space i mean we're in a this little weird asteroid field outside crew 05 we're hitting nine i see we're going past 990 so indeed, I think the speed of the ship is probably close to a thousand meters a second. OK, 
let's spool up the quantum drive and we will uh test this ship out in atmosphere and we'll see how she flies so stay tuned all right guys we're here at Eda, and we're gonna go take the hammerhead flying around atmosphere here we go so right now we're just gonna do scm speed and let's see how that goes that's actually pretty slow <laughs> I'm not going to lie, the, the Hammerhead's SEM speed is not uh, fantastic. So, uh, let's bump it up a notch. Looks like it's handling things pretty darn well. We'll head for this mountain range over here. You can see it's drifting a little bit. Engaging the boost. Oh yeah, it gets us out there pretty well. Straighten us out. It is an interesting little moon. It's got all these crazy, I think they're like mites because they come from the bottom. Let's make a roll around this. Oh, that was tight. Oh, come back to even. Ooh. That was, that was, that's pretty tight around this, uh, with this ship. Let's head straight over the top of one of these mountains. Let's go through this uh, crevice here. All right. Well, that was pretty nice, I gotta admit. We come up on this other mountain range. Let's check out the yaw. So it doesn't yaw real great. It rolls pretty well. But it is a lot more nimble, I think, than, than people are giving it credit for. Uh, as, as big of a ship as it is, it does it does maneuver pretty darn well. And it gets it gets some good speed here in atmosphere, which honestly is pretty unexpected to be to be completely honest. Let's uh let's check out this mountain here. We'll make a, a right roll around here. Check out that. It's it's actually flying really, really nice. Um, now, one thing to take note of is that there are no... I can't fight with this ship solo. And because I have no weapons. So... I do have missiles as part of the the pilot here, um, and I, I believe the co-pilot does have access at some times. Um, but you can see we have 32 missiles. We have 16 Vipers, and we have 16 Arresters. That's that's a lot of missiles. Go ahead and pull a 360 here. Hopefully we don't die. Oh, that was that was massive. Let's check out these arresters from from the pilot. Firing. OK. We'll switch over to the Vipers. Let's go into third person for that one. And we will fire. Looks like the missiles are coming from the bottom of the ship. See if we can figure out where they're coming from. Oh, there we go. We definitely see where the missiles are coming from. Um, right here on the bottom as we zoom in a little bit. Those are the missile doors. Whoa, pay attention to what you're doing, Fist. So, I mean, what do you guys think about the ship in uh, the atmosphere? I think it's... It's pretty nice, but I didn't do an animation for the landing gear and stuff. So there's the missile bay doors closing. Let's let's go ahead and hit in for the landing gear. You can see the gear comes out in a tricycle formation. Actually, you know what? Listen, we're, we're pretty close to a a base. Let's I think we're close to Woodruff. Let's go ahead and land and see what fits inside this hangar. OK, Woodruff here on Eda. I think there's only two stations 
it's about 30 kilometers ahead of us, so let's let's give this bee some speed here in Atmo and see what she can do. This ought to be interesting. I, I don't mind flying in first person in this ship. It's pretty interesting. Hopefully we don't overfly Ida or the, the station. As you can see, we're doing oh, well over 600 meters a second. In, in this ship. Let me actually bring my quantum on. We're getting really close. I mean, this thing hauls. Even in atmosphere. I've seen smaller ships do worse. There's there's definitely something to be said for that. Um, I think this, this ship is definitely a, a capable fighter in atmosphere. Uh, as well as in space, as you'll see in the the chase footage when uh, when we get to that part. Oh, and there is there is Woodruff. So I believe our gear is already down. We're going to turn VTOL on, and there's one big old pag just for us. Let's land this sucker. All right. Always kind of an optical illusion when you land from this angle of what is center. There you go. Eh, not my best landing, but uh, everything's on the pad. And there we go. The hammerhead has landed. All right. So as usual in 317, there's issues. So I'm going to make sure to turn off the engine. We're going to go ahead and exit the seat here. I'm going to go and pick up a vehicle to stick into the cargo bay. So I'll see you when we're about to load it up. So I did say earlier that I was going to show off the personnel elevators. So let's do that now. And this is the second take of the shot because, of course, I first time I went down, I did it without a helmet on. Look at that little med pin causing all that damage. So, like anything else, oh, I would tell you to make sure your elevators go back up. There we go. We were able to get off the ship somehow. I don't know what's causing the ship to move. Um, had to be the elevator. Very odd. Anyway, uh, let me go pick up the vehicle. We'll see you in just a sec. All right, guys, so we are in an Ursa rover right now, and we're going to attempt to put it inside the, the hammerhead. Looks like it just clears the back weapon there. Of course, the hammerhead is squatted down right now as well. There is a front ramp deal that I can't go past. And we'll swing the camera around a little bit to show you that it, I mean, it just fits, just fits. And we'll uh, go ahead and exit the Ursa. Of course, exit on top. Why not? <laughs> Another bug. And we're going to go ahead and click go up. And hopefully the, sh the Ursa won't bounce around like crazy and kill me. Eh, not too bad. And we are loaded. So I believe the Hammerhead does have around um, 40 SCU, I believe. Um, and it's not it's not terrible. Uh, of course, you could do a million box missions in here if you wanted to. <laughs> But who wants to do that? Um, yeah, it's it fits an Ursa rover just perfect inside of its cargo bay, which means it'll fit a couple Drake mules. It'll fit a couple dragonflies, a couple hover quads, um, at least one cyclone. Maybe you could squeeze two in there, but probably just one. Uh, but, you know, you could also fill this thing up with uh, a load of uh, cargo if you wanted to. Not that this is the best ship to make cargo runs on, but, you know, it's not it's not horrible, I guess, is what I would have to say. So 
Let's go back up uh, to the bridge. We'll take off here, and the next thing I want to show you guys is flying through, uh, flying to a, a station, and then uh, okay, what did I lose my? Oh, there's the bridge. It is easy to not find the bridge. I don't fly this enough though, because honestly, guys, this is a multi-crew ship. You you, you don't want to do this alone. Maybe if it's one of the only bigger ships you had, you do it alone. But uh, most of the time, you're going to want a crew of people in here, whether it's hired NPCs one day or whether it's your friends and your org or whatever. So there we go. The ship is ready to take off. And there we go. We retract our gear. And see you later, HDMS Woodruff. We're going to head on out of the atmosphere. And there we go. Um, so I am going to head over to Everest Harbor because I want to show the ship being able to dock, which is pretty important, I think, to be able to see the ship dock. So let's go ahead and not mess around here. We'll go into our map um, and we will find Everest Harbor. You've already seen us land. You can land at this at stations like Port Olisar. Uh, um, you can land it at Grim Hex. Um, it does go into some of the rest and relax stations um, into their hangars. It looks like it won't fit, but it actually does fit surprisingly. Chasing that arrow. Oh, that's probably the Ursa I'm chasing. Okay. So I did cheat a little bit, guys. I, I do have a TS2 in here. That's why the quantum drive is spooling up so fast. So you'll see when I do the loadout how badly you want to upgrade the, the quantum drive. It has stock. It has the comma drive, which is by far the lowest drive in the game takes forever to spool takes forever to quantum so that is and of any upgrades you do i think that is a must and consequently the fastest size three quantum drive in the game is the ts2 and it is also the cheapest which is actually quite odd um how that works it should be one of the most expensive in my opinion, but maybe it's not the most efficient. I haven't really looked at those power curves. Let's get a shot at what this ship looks like flying over Hurston. That looks actually spectacular. What do you guys think of the Hammerhead? What do you think of the design of the Hammerhead? Um, do you really like this ship? Is it, is it something you would buy? I want to hear your comments in the comment section below. Not only does it help with the, the YouTube algorithm, it I, I'm genuinely curious of what your opinions are on the ship. So for docking, and I am not going to do a manual dock, although I'll probably get pretty close. I'm going to fly fairly close into the station. Um, am I upside down? I might be. As you get in, you're going to want to wait till you get that whole uh, call ATC. Um, you want to get pretty close before you call for a landing. And so you'll be able to dock at stations like Port Olisar, Port Tressler, Igeni Point. Uh, I'm sorry, not Port Olisar. You'll be able to land at Port Olisar, uh, Everest Harbor here. Um, at the bigger cities, you'll be able to just land in one of the big hangars. So here I'm going to call for a landing. I am upside down. Dang it. I was correct the first time. So we can see there's two docking ports on these bigger space stations, and this one happens to be over here. So you see I got those two dots. This is not a guide on how to dock, but that big white circle there, and that's what I'm going for. Um... I need to go try to go SCM speed here. It's 
so it's not at this uh, arm it's it's at the arm in front of us and it kind of tells you how far away you are about four kilometers away from it, it, it when you do manually dock you do need to line up those those two dots i have two red dots on the screen i have a red dot in the center and a green dot on the side and you gotta line everything up and the hammerhead's probably the easiest to do just because uh the where you actually dock is right above the cockpit uh the 890 jump is much harder to do so seeing us come in from third person here we can see that the the docking arm has been extended it's hard to see but we are going to take a look at it in third person like over in this angle when we get to it and you know i'm going to proceed to it nice and slow here i definitely don't want to crash into the station i don't want a crime stat i don't want to blow up my ship <laughs> And I think the docking arm is on this side. Let's turn the lights on. Yeah, that doesn't do any good. Okay. As we get close up, you see how that one dot turned green? That's a good thing. You, I would basically have to line everything up. I'm a little too high. See how everything's kind of going green for manual dock? When you get about this close... I'm going to stop, and all you got to do is hold in. Boom. And it, it just like an auto landing, it auto docks. So if we can, we're going to see the auto docking here. The docking arm comes out. And the ship is... I believe the ship is... I don't know if the ship's moving or if the docking arm is moving. It looks like the ship's moving. And so this thing will automatically align. So the ship's restaurant's thruster is just fired. And it's going to dock into that top airlock. And when that square gets that size and it says docking complete, you're done. And it will turn off your engines for you, even though they still show that they're on. And at this point, you if everything's working correctly, you should be able to re repair, refuel, rearm, etc., etc. So the only thing left to do now is to exit the ship. So let's go ahead and uh, we'll do that now. OK, now that we are out of the bridge, we're going to head straight towards the airlock. We're going to open our inner door and we can see the the two outer doors are already open i would highly recommend as you exit this door to if you kind of come back a little bit you can close that airlock door oh there we go so it does close that door and it prevents people from running into your ship because you you can't control this door which belongs to the station and we'll head down this uh long dock arm and we'll go hang out with the NPCs and check out the hammerhead there's two docking ports this is docking port two there is the hammerhead all docked and ready to go into storage next up on the video we're going to take a look at the loadout and then we're going to do our fighting footage of a fully crewed hammerhead what it looks like to fight in both atmosphere and in space and in atmosphere we actually go after another hammerhead so thanks for watching so far and stay tuned for that well, all right folks so here we are at urkel.games we're at the loadout section for the hammerhead um First things first, let's take a look at some of the base stats here. The It is a roll of a Corvette, um, although I think it's very small on the Corvette side. Um, it is a combat ship considered size 5. Um, I don't know why it says crew size 2 here. Crew size 2 here on Urkel, it's really 3 to 9. But we can see that there is 80,000 hit points on both the body and the nose, giving a total hit points, whole hit points. 295,600. That is quite a lot. We could see the uh, 
ship is also quite heavy at uh, 4.6 million kilograms. Um, it gives the speed at 105 at SEM speed. I wasn't quite able to get there, um, but it's it, it's pretty it's pretty close. Uh, um, afterburner speed at a thousand meters a second. Again, I, I got really close to that, um, but I wasn't able to achieve that. Um, it, it gives our max pitch yaw and roll stats at 20 for pitch, 18 for yaw, 60 for roll, which feels about right. Um, for a ship this size, it actually is quite nimble. Uh, the rolls and the pitch, the pitch, just those two extra degrees does help significantly. Um, as a larger ship uh, with size three components, it does have a large hydrogen fuel tank at 15 million liters and a quantum fuel capacity is actually low, in my opinion, at 11,000 liters, but... It does just fine. It'll get anywhere around Stanton, even with the fastest drive with plenty of quantum fuel to spare. Now, let's take a uh, um, one thing that's not up here is that it does have 40 SCU of cargo space, uh, which you can put cargo in the cargo bay. You could also uh, put an Ursa rover in there, uh, Humber quads, dragonflies, cyclone, stuff like that. The Drake mule, you could probably fit a couple of those in there. Um, but let's talk about the weapons, right? The ship is a combat ship. We can see that the turrets by themselves, um, there's six of them, and there's four CF-447 Rhino laser repeaters that come stock on each one of them. So for sustained damage, if all the lasers were hitting a single target at once, it would do 12,288 DPS. First damage is 15,000. 15, um, so it really lights it up. As far as missiles go, this thing has a ton of missiles. Um, it comes stock with 16 Arrestor 3 size 3 cross sections and 16 Viper 3 infrareds. Um, <clears throat> the total missile damage, if all the missiles were to hit the same target, would be 91,933 damage. That is a lot of damage. Um, in addition to that, uh, <clears throat> the shields, it has size three shields. Um, it comes with industrial grade three stronghold shields. Uh, two of those um, give out 100,000 hit points each. Do I think that's the best? No, not necessarily. Um, they're not horrible uh, shields by any means. Uh, that's a lot of shield hit points, but if you wanted to max it out, um, I would probably go for probably go for the military FR-86s. Um, but since shields in 317.2 don't matter a lot, um, I might go with the the highest civilian shields, the 7 CA Narguns. Um, they, they're the same shield hit points, um, but it, at 101,000 versus the FR-66 being 136,000, it's a little bit cheaper. Although, you know, at that cost, it's it's fairly negligible. But we'll, we'll go ahead and give it a max uh, loadout here. With the power plants, we can see up here in the power plants, we're using 11,722 out of 75,000. I don't think there's any reason to upgrade. It comes with two military grade C super drives. I think those are fine. Um, I don't see any need to update those. Um, let's see. The coolers. We're using 1,800 K out of 20,000 capacity. So uh, this thing comes with two Mercury military grade C coolers. Again, I wouldn't change those out. There's no need to. Maybe one day in the future we go industrial and we put chill maxes in there. But for right now, it does not need it. The one thing I think you must upgrade on this ship is the quantum drive it comes with the comma which is an industrial grade c it's extremely slow it only goes fifty nine thousand kilometers a second it is however extremely efficient so if you're okay with it taking 17 minutes to go from almost the farthest distance which is my microtech to arc corp 17 minutes for that using this drive, but it is really efficient. So that'll be super helpful in places like Pyro. Um, and the time does go by fast when you have people on Discord and you're chatting and things like that. But if you're trying to get somewhere, uh, especially just still in Stanton right now, I would upgrade to the military TS2. 
It's the fastest size three drive in the game. It's the fastest drive in the game, period, um, that we have access to. And it goes 208,561 kilometers a second versus the commas very slow 56,000. You will get from Microtech to Arcorp in five and a half minutes versus 17. That's a significant difference. And, you know, the price is actually really fair. The TS2 is the lowest price out of all the military drives as a grade A. It's 93,700, and you can pick it up at uh, Crew All Five or Orison. So, before we talk about paint, um, let's look at EM. EM uh, is 23,887, IR is 15,777. That's actually really high, um, obviously, because the ship is huge. It has, it's going to put out a lot of energy. Um, but, it could be higher, so I think it's I think it's fair. I think that is definitely fair. People are going to see you coming. You're not going to be stealthy. Even going full stealth and full ballistic, they're still going to see you coming. It's a massive ship, so I wouldn't worry too much about stealth. And lastly, we'll talk about the uh, the paints. The ship does come with two paints. the uh, The first one is the Hammerhead Polar Camo Livery. Um. This livery is like the white and gray camo paint scheme. It uh, specifically came out in 2951 at the International Aerospace Expo. The other paint for the hammerhead besides the stock is the Stormbringer, which is kind of a blue, black, weird looking paint on the hammerhead, to be honest with you. Um, I don't like it. I wish the Hammerhead had more paints. I wish it had a camo um, kind of green, OD green. Um, I wish it had a bunch of different paints that it just doesn't have, um, unfortunately. But, you know, uh, I'm thinking maybe this year it'll come out with a different paint. Now, there is a another paint, which is actually a different ship, and that's the Hammerhead Best in Show Edition. Um, which is kind of, you had to get it at 2949 IAE, so it was a few years ago. Um, and it is a limited white and purple livery, which doesn't look too bad on the Hammerhead. However, back in those days, it's it's actually a separate ship. It is not just a paint. It's a ship. So you would have had to buy that as a different ship. There we go, guys. That is the loadout for the Hammerhead. Pretty short, pretty sweet. Let's, uh... Pull my cart up here, empty that out, and we will send all our stock, non-stock items to the cart. So if we upgrade our shields, upgrade our quantum drive, we're looking at a hefty, hefty price tag of 366,500 Alpha UEC, which is which is quite high. Um, I would probably skip the shields and just look at upgrading the quantum drive. Um, that is my recommendation. And I'm sticking to it. So without further ado, let's go check out what the ship looks like in combat, both in and out of atmosphere with the Sons of Valhalla. Uh, stay tuned for that. That should be awesome.
Right, guys well that concludes the hammerhead video i hope you had a good time watching it hope you enjoyed the chase combat scenes uh it was a lot of fun to film this video it's new stuff i'm trying out in the videos to give you guys more information a little bit more background a little bit cleaner video and uh so i'm hoping you're enjoying that now final thoughts on the aegis hammerhead I really like the ship, but it is strictly a combat ship. It doesn't have a lot of frills to it, and maybe that's your thing. It's it's not necessarily mine. Mine is a loaner for another ship that I have purchased, so I don't actually own this guy uh, when my final ship comes in. And I don't think I'm going to buy one in the future either. I say that because... The price tag for this thing is over 700 US dollars. That is very expensive. And I don't think the ship's worth it. Uh, you could get a Benning Merchantman, a uh, Aegis or uh, Anvil Carrick 
uh, for cheaper, and they have, you know, more function and, and more firepower, to be honest. Um, there's also, like, an 890 jump. While that is more expensive than the Hammerhead, it has way more function as far as being in the game. It has more cargo, it has similar sized weapons, and, and it, it can do more things. You can do more with it. I, I, with the Carrick still at 600 some dollars, it's cheaper than the Hammerhead, and, the, and it offers almost the same stuff. But it, it's not going to be as armored when we have armor one day, and it's not going to be as good as taking out fighters. Um, but the Hammerhead's not great at taking out capital ships. So I do think it's overpriced by about $150. I think about 550 or so would be the right price. But I also don't see CIG lowering the price anytime soon. It is a lot of fun, and I mean a lot of fun. I can't overemphasize that when you have a full crew. When you have your org in there, you have six gunners, pilot, co-pilot, and one day an engineering person or a captain or something. The Hammerhead's going to be an absolute blast to play. It's going to be the probably the number one pirate killer with a full crew. Um, just going out and taking people out. And we'll see what the gameplay has in the future. I hope it's good. So that, that essentially wraps up the video. I thank you guys for watching. Um, if you enjoy content like this, then make sure to uh, head over to Fist and Jawa. Dot org. That's A-N-D, not I-N-G. And you can uh, get our links to our Discord, which is also in the video description. Um, you can get our org link and things like that. You know, if you're interested in joining the Sons of Valhalla, please shoot me a line in Discord or go ahead and do an application. Um, we're always looking for people to play with and hang out with. We stream every Thursday night at 7 p.m. Mountain Time. And Java usually streams on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. Mountain Time, Java with Java, which is mostly mining and things like that. But occasionally they get into some other shenanigans. And with that, I think we're going to end the video. I want to thank the Sons of Valhalla for helping out with all the combat stuff we had to do in the video. Uh, I want to specifically call out Scroll Lord Gaming and uh, his excellent pilot skills. If you guys haven't been to his channel, check out Scroll Lord Gaming on YouTube. Awesome guy, helps out a ton. Uh, he's getting into the PvP world of Star Citizen, so uh, if you're reg, you're dead is his motto, I guess. <laughs> so with that, I am Fist25, and remember, if the fists don't get you, the lightning bolt will. Good night, Stan.